Chiltrak's heart was racing. A chance encounter with a group of surprisingly violent mimics had separated him from his party. The Halfwood's feet were burning and his forehead was covered in sweat. Exhausted, he sat down. He had been in such a panic that he didn't even realize how far he had ran, in which direction he had jumped. So much for him being the great tracker. He exhaled, looking into the direction he had come from. There was a chance no one saw him run away. By gods, if he got lost this deep in the dungeon, he would never be retrieved. Sighing, Chilchuk went on his feet, growled to himself, and then started walking again. The dungeon part the party found themselves in was at least on the outside a simple church masoned out of the naked rock of a lit cavern. However, upon entering, it revealed itself to be the entrance to a stairwell going down, down, down. It was similar to an area much higher up in the dungeon, just more creepy. Smelling of dust and moist earth. But what was worse about it was the mimics. Everything down here seemed to be one. Not just chests, vases, random armor pieces, even statues and gargoyles had been hollowed out by the crab-like monsters to be used. The problem was that they were supposed to be rather passive. According to the dungeon guidebook, they were a plant-eating subspecies that fed on the level's algae that grew on the more moist walls. Even Senshi didn't know they were on this level to begin with, from his own explorations of it. However, now they seemed cautious, borderline aggressive. It had worried the dwarf. Something was disrupting the ecosystem of the dungeon level and no one wanted to meet the creature that was causing the mimics to go berserk. In hindsight, running away out of fear was an even worse decision. But Chiltra couldn't do anything against his phobia of the monsters. Just the thought of the crustaceans made his hair stand up. His hands tightly gripping his backpack, he wandered into a large square room. He vaguely remembered rushing through it. It had a few empty shelves, a couple of destroyed barrels and vase shards, like someone had tried to prevent any mimics from creating a home here. Perhaps they might have even been looking for them, though that was a stretch. Why would anyone look for mimics? They didn't hide any treasure. But then his thoughts moved to the entity that was making the mimics go crazy. Was it them? Cautiously looking around, he decided to investigate. The items seemed to have been smashed by a blunt weapon, like a club or hammer. While the shards of the vases weren't really telling of the truth, it was the barrels. The way the destroyed wood was smashed and iron rings dented, it gave it away. Additionally, there were no claw marks, meaning whatever did this, or more, whoever did this, used tools and didn't solely rely on claws or talons. Interesting. He was 50% sure this either were adventurers who got way too deep and way over their head. With the strength displayed, however, it could only be a tall man or a dwarf, as elves preferred magic or slender blades, and half-foots like him, well, they definitely couldn't do that without explosives. Since there was no burnt traces or smell of sulfur, this definitely wasn't the case. Or the other 50%. The entity that pissed off the mimics was at least sentient enough to use weapons. It could only be one of the two. Chiltrak stood up, looking around one final time before pushing ahead. He was not really sure if he should start shouting, especially with the knowledge he had now. He stopped at the T section of the dungeon. Damn it, he didn't remember this one. Though he vaguely remembered that he went left at least once. Ugh, what a pain. But as he looked right and then left, he noticed lit torches on both sides. 
His party probably went through here, completely missing the side passage. He chuckled. That was foolish. That was an old goblin trick. <laughs> uh, why was he suddenly feeling so proud of himself? Gripping the straps of his backpack tightly, he began jogging left, feeling confident that whatever path he was walking on now was already cleared by his party. Though this didn't last long at all. As he stumbled into a round lit up room covered in mimic shells. With a shaking hand, he picked one up. It was of a claw. It was raw and uncooked, but the meat inside had been removed entirely. Now he wasn't so sure his party came through here. Whatever smashed those barrels earlier wasn't a tall man or a dwarf. Must be bigger if they can do this. And probably have some stronger stomach acid to not get some crazy infection. But what could that be? And that's when a new smell entered his nostrils from behind. It was... musky. A mix of fur, sweat and blood. With an almost feminine, sweet undertone that he could just barely pick up on. Wait, was that an... Wham! Something hit Chilchuk in the back of his head. His mind was spinning, as his body felt stiff from his hit. But he wasn't knocked out, thankfully. Whoever or whatever hit him made sure he wouldn't receive any serious injuries. He heard noises of empty shells being crushed or shoved around, maybe even kicked around. He tried to open the eyes, but the pain was too strong. There was this attack technique berserkers and warriors both used. It was one of the first moves they usually learned during their training journey. They called it stunning blow or stunning hit. Using a blunt weapon or object or the butt of a sword, it was a simple heavy hit against the strongest part of a person's skull. Though usually that hit was already enough to straight up kill a half foot, so someone must have really held back. He grunted, causing whoever was making a ruckus to stop and approach. Chilchuk never thought he would ever experience a stunning blow. Heavy footsteps. You heard heavy footsteps. How in the nine hells did this thing manage to sneak up on him with footsteps like that? And like a wall of feet and musk, the creature stopped right before him. It grabbed him by the head in his right arm. It was smelling, testing the air. It must have huge nostrils, judging by its grunt-like breaths. Its hands felt strong and they were covered in fur. He concentrated, focused, and finally managed to open his eyes. His gaze meeting yours. You let go of the half-foot, jumping back, shocked that he already recovered and that he was still alive. He rubbed his head. Holding his hand before his eyes, he noticed some blood. <sighs> you broke out in tears, pressing yourself against him. Your body was hot and fluffy. Epi thought she killed you. Whoa, 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 what? Stop that. Uh, get off me. Chiltrak pushed his hand in your crying face. You are suffocating him with your muscles. Jeez. Ugh. I have never seen a crying orc before. What the hell is going on here? He looked at you. For an orc, you were a little... small. About the size of a slightly larger tall man. Maybe just a little bit taller than Laios. Your fur was a beautiful pale white, with the hairs on your head just going past your shoulders. Your eyes were big and round with a reddish tint. An albino orc? Well, you may be a little short for an orc, but you still towered over him. Not to mention your muscles. They were big enough to tear mimics limb from limb. But aside from your albinoism, that wasn't all the abnormalities of you. Your feet looked human all by covered in the same fur. They had 
even toes. And your stomach showed off white and slightly scarred skin. As no fur seemed to grow there. You are dressed in a rough leather skirt, clearly handmade like all orc clothing, with what seemed to be mimic shells strapped around your chest, arms and knees for protection. Even though it seemed like you should protect your belly more. A small bag was strapped around your shoulder, hanging from your hip. Though, considering your size, it probably still fit a lot in it. It was then that he finally put two and two together. An albino orc with patches of fur missing and normal human feet. Wait, you're a half-orc? Tall men, half-foot, dwarfs and elves all were considered humans, due to how alike they looked as well as having the ability to breed with one another. For instance, he assumed for the longest time that his party member Marcel may be a half-elf due to her ears being slightly more rounded at their tips than those compared to regular elves. Orcs, on the other hand, rarely positively interacted with the other races, nor did they look close to humans, due to their sheer size and boar-like features. Still, though, over the decades, very rarely, did half-orc sightings occur, though no one ever really believed in them. You tilted your head. E.P. is an orc, yes? E.P.? Is that your name? You nodded. It's what Mother called E.P. when I was talking to her. Chilchuck deadpanned, talking in third person like a child. Though you were fully grown. For years you had been alone walking around in this maze. But all you ever found were these strange crap things hiding in furniture. Though they were quite tasty. <sighs> I assume you're the reason for all the dead mimics, huh? If you was hungry, you said with a proud smile. Right, right. You reach into your back, pulling out rough cloth patches. Oh, wait... Were those... He shook as you started wrapping them around his head. Gross, he thought. They were very unprofessional and used bandages. While there had been an attempt at washing them, they must be quite unclean. If you had been using these for years, you giggled proudly. Oh no. But at least she washed them, he thought. They didn't smell, at least. You proudly tilted your head and nodded. Why are you doing this? Because your EP is new husband. What? Chilchuck jumped up. No, 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 no. The, where's this coming from? EP has been alone looking for a maid for so long. EP doesn't care anymore. As long as they're nice. You haven't tried hurting EP yet. You're nice. Crap. Looks like the situation was worse than he thought. Uh, look, he stuttered. I, I, I can't be your husband, okay? He raised both hands defensively. First of all, I, I'm a half foot. You'd crush me. You smiled. But Ippy didn't kill you with that blow, did she? No, no, no. Ippy knows how to hold back. Jill Chuck rolled his eyes. Didn't you just think you killed him by accident? Aside from that, I'm already married. I have two daughters. Saying this, however, didn't have the intended effect. <gasps> that makes you fertile! You've wrapped your thick arms around him. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Eepy thinks you'd be the perfect little husband for Eepy. You rubbed your face against his, and he couldn't help but blush. Your body was so warm and soft, and it took him until now to realize... The smell emanating from you. The sweetness of it. Oh no. You were in the rut. That's how your female smell managed to penetrate the typical orc smell. This was bad. Rutting orc's sweat was a very expensive aphrodisiac in the east. He had to slow his breathing or else he too would turn into a horny mess like you. No matter what. It's sad. You twisted to see it as a new reason to attach yourself to him as well. Not to mention, 
The most fertile and physically capable orcs and tribes also tended to have harems. So it could be that that's why you didn't see an issue with that. Your hands were already reaching for the belts that held his leather tunic together. Hey, 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 your name's E.P., right? Hmm? You leaned back, looking at your little husband. Uh, mm, okay, before we do anything, how, how about you tell me how you even got down here? Okay? You know, a little introduction. You tapped a finger against your chin and thought. You're right. Evie will tell you everything. You sat down next to him, propping yourself up with your arms as you leaned back. Your feet were happily wiggling as you began to tell him who you were. And it quickly became clear that you shouldn't be so happy about all this. You were born as the daughter to the shaman of a nomadic orc tribe. Unlike the orcs on the upper levels, the orcs you once belonged to were devout followers of the orc god of blood. They raided villages with their abandon and took their men to drink their blood as both a show of respect for their warrior spirit, but also as humiliation for having lost. According to your descriptions, you were the result of a fertility ritual gone wrong, where the shaman performed vile acts with the male sacrifice, slitting his throat before he could finish, but apparently... Apparently, this ritual made orc men go mad with lust. But the tall man had finished too soon, resulting in your birth. You were shunned as a half-breed, and you were meant to be sacrificed the day you became of age. But your mother, stricken with grief, instead threw you into the dungeon. Your survival chances down here being better than with the tribe. And the nonchalantness of your explanation made Chilchuk's stomach turn. Still, though, Chilchuk had a problem. Since you were in your rut, which also seemed to be your first rut considering your immaturity and lack of knowledge on the subject, he was in grave danger, and technically any male on the dungeon level. Just his terrible luck that he had to be the first to encounter you. He shuddered at the thought of you encountering Laios first. Then again, he didn't seem like the sort of guy who would realize what was going on until it was actually happening. Listen, uh, E.P., I... You looked at him, smiling. Oh, crap, why was he blushing now? I really can't do this with you. Uh, as I said, I I'm married. And you can marry E.P. too. Stupid orcs, he thought. No, see, that's the pro- Halffoots, we- we have this- uh. Chilchuk stopped himself. A horrifying thought came to him. With your simple-mindedness, if he said that normal humans, Halffoots included, usually remained with just one partner, there was a very high likelihood your brain would make the wrong connections, causing you to conclude that- Killing his wife and daughters was the correct next step, and maybe even the expected next step. He wanted to inhale deeply as he realized that to refocus his attention, but if he kept inhaling your musk, there was no saying what his body would do. So instead of sighing, he stopped breathing entirely as he sunk his head and thought. He could try running. The ruckers you'd make in the process would attract the others, maybe. Then again, Chilchuk didn't want to hear their stupid comments about the situation. Fighting you was also a zero-chance endeavor. You'd probably just see it as him playing around. Not to mention he was powerless against you. However, just as he developed the beginnings of a plan, his eyes widened in pain and he took a deep breath, slapping both hands on his mouth. What's wrong? You asked, curiously, as you got on all fours, crawling over to him so close your noses almost touched. You blinked at him with your big, wide eyes, and then your lips twitched into a smile. You pecked his nose quickly like a snack, which made his cheeks go red. That was really cute. 
Uncomfortably, he closed his legs, but you knew what that meant. You had him around your finger. E.P. wants to play with her husband now. You purred. Not letting him respond, you pressed your lips onto his. It was funny. His mouth was so small compared to yours. And he was completely helpless against you. Your soft, lewd body pressed against his. Your thick tongue forcing its way into his mouth, keeping it open. He inhaled your scent through his nose. Chilchuk's eyes rolled back. He was no longer thinking, giving in to the pleasure your body was giving him. His hands slapped on your hips, fingers ruffling through your fur until they met your soft muscles. Crap, why did this feel so good? This better not have awakened anything in him. He was so embarrassed, but the more he gave into you, the better he felt. And so he hummed into you, his arms moving to your neck to push your faces closer together. Meanwhile, your hands got a little frisky, continuing to fiddle with the belts holding his armor together. You knew how annoying it was to fix ladder in the dungeon, and such you didn't want to tear it apart, even though you definitely could and definitely wanted. And so he let go of your head, and you took it as a sign that he wanted to say something. He was breathing heavy air as you pulled out of his mouth. <sighs> let me... Let me do that, Hippie. He huffed. With his little lean body, he began undressing while you licked your lips. You licked your lips and then opened the leather bands that held your makeshift armor together. Chilchuck's eyes whined when you pulled the chest armor off. You smiled innocently down at him. You have Hippie's permission to touch them. You purred into his ear. Lyos pulled Kensuke out of the broken shit in his head of a mimic. Oh, jeez, I really need a break. This earned him a heat from a sealed staff on his head. Ow! Don't be an idiot. We need to find Chilchuck. You can take a break when we found him. Okay, okay. The warrior groaned. Well, I do think we're getting closer to him. See, the torches have been lit, said Senshi as he pointed at one. Yeah, <clears throat> let's get going. Meanwhile, Izutsumi's ears twitched. She was already smelling something strange, and now she was also hearing something she would describe as strange. And when she realized what these strange sounds and strange smells meant, her tail puffed up. I think I'm gonna hurl. Huh? Master looked at the cat woman. What's wrong? Are you sick? She patted Izutsumi's head gently, but then was scratched by her. Stop that! Sorry, sorry. Um, <clears throat> anyways, I think I hear them over there. She pointed towards a T-shaped hallway. Though, I think we should split up. I go left, you guys go ahead. Don't worry, I'll find you if I find him. She mused. Are you sure? I have very good ears, she said with a deadpan. I don't know. I mean, Lyos chimed in. Uh, considering the size of the level, this would give us more ground to cover. And who better to find their way back to us than Yuzutsumi? Marcio sighed. <gasps> Okay, then. You go left, we go on ahead. Getting all fours, Izutsumi vanished in the darkness of the T-shaped hallway. Glad the others didn't see her smile. Thank you for watching my video until the very end. And I would like to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment something down below. I read every comment you write to me and I try to re reply to them as often as I can.
But before we say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely darling stewards who so graciously support my third tier membership. Husky HD 17, Hopeful, Castella Misery, Brie, Zoe, Ikea, Mystic Jade 111, Annabel R. Contreras, Giovanni Moriarty, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Bitbit, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you so much for your continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my lovely darling mates for also supporting me financially. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day and please remember to like and subscribe.